Excuse me, sir. Would you like another hot take? Yeah, definitely. Keep on coming. How's it going, everyone? Hope you had a great week so far. Let's go ahead and jump into our hot takes. First up, the Texas Rangers. As I predicted before the season, they're starting to fall apart because of their bullpen not reinforcing their starters. Their bullpen last year actually had more blown saves than saves. That's a crazy statistic considering they won the World Series. They just got hot at the right time and were able to pull together to get the World Series win. Um, also, they need to keep getting started pitching. They're relying on a lot of mediocre players. Again, just got hot at the right time. Also, Langford, I predicted he would slump. Doesn't mean he's not a super prospect, but those power hitters tend to do that. He might even get sent down. If not, I expect him to put together in second half. Remember, even Mike Trout got sent down his first year. So please, Ranger fans, don't lose doubt about that. I mean, look, I like you guys. Um, next, whatever wide receiver that the Giants draft. I feel sorry for him. He's going to be a bust. With Danny Dimes there, whenever he should be making passes, he gets scared and runs. He just isn't that great of a thrower. Um, unfortunately, that wide receiver is going to be a bust and not by his fault, whether uh, it's for his career or until they get in our quarterback or he goes to a new team. Hopefully, he's not ruined psychologically, but I just would stay of Way from who are they drafting Dynasty and Fantasy, even with a high first round grade on that wide receiver. This week's hot takes, I got some mother. I almost swore, but I didn't. All right. So relax, relax. All right. I'm just so excited because NBA postseason is tipping off this week. Out of the East, I'm taking the Boston Celtics. Why am I taking the Boston Celtics? Well, I mean, there is some good teams in the East, but they're just head and shoulders above the rest. However, the Knicks can make a run. Greek Freak and the Bucks can make a run. My Chicago Bulls, they can make a run. Yeah, right. Well, anyways, I don't have Boston Celtics winning it all. And that is because I have the Denver Nuggets going back to back. And my boy, Jokic, getting back to back finals MVPs. It's a beautiful thing. It's going to happen. My other hot take today, I'll just give you a quick one. Chelsea finishes top six above Man U above West Ham, they're in that sixth spot market. Jamar Chase is not a top five wide receiver in fantasy this year. Jamar Chase is as talented as any receiver in the league, and at his best, he can put up monster stats. But for me, Chase's two hit or miss to take in the first round in a fantasy draft, especially in redraft leagues. He has huge games where he just dominates. He can put up 50 points in a week, but then he also has games where he just disappears and puts up you know, three, four, five points. You just don't want that. You want more consistency with your top guy. And I would much rather have a player like C.D. Lamb, Tyreek Hill, Justin Jefferson, Amon Ross St. Brown, Puka Nakua, even A.J. Brown, Brandon Ayuk, and Garrett Wilson, I would take over Chase this season. My hot take of the week. Now that Caitlin Clark has been selected number one overall by the Indiana Fever, I do believe that she goes on to become the best player in the WNBA. Yes, you can knock her for her size or other attributes. However... Anytime I watch her, all I see is greatness, and it doesn't matter if she's not going to be making that much money playing in the, w in the WNBA because she's going to make tens of millions of dollars in endorsement, if not hundreds of millions. And on a side note, what's up with the name, the team name Fever? I mean, are we just naming sports teams after, you know, the Chicago coronavirus? I mean, like, what's next, you know? But yes, Caitlin Clark is great. She deserved to be number one and she's gonna be number one this year. Hey everybody, it's Donna over here in Las Vegas. Joshua has asked me to do a quick hot take. I love Travis Kelsey way before Taylor Swift. And uh, everyone has asked me who I think is gonna win MVP this year. And I would love nothing more than for Travis Kelsey to win MVP, but I just feel like most of the time it's a quarterback that wins it. So if I were to pick a quarterback, of course it'd be Patrick Mahomes, but I have some friends that have picked CJ Stroud. So that is one of the popular picks for MVP. Um, definitely am excited to give you guys more intake. So see you guys next time. Bye. Next up, Jacob and I are gonna debate the pros and cons of running back Joe Mixon, now that he is with the Houston Texans, 
and I am going to have the honors of starting with the pros. Let's just face a couple of facts here. Number one, Joe Mixon is extremely durable in his seven years in the league. He's only missed more than two games one time. That's very reliable and hard to say for any running back. Name any one running back you can say that about besides Joe Mixon that's been in the league for seven years. I'll give you as long as you want, do your research, and leave a comment because you're not going to find anyone else. Fact number two, Joe Mixon has finished as an RB1 over 70% of the time. And let me just take the percentage out of that. In seven years, he's been an RB1 five out of seven times. So that's very bankable statistics. And finally, number three, he's now on the Houston Texans, who have Stephon Diggs, Nico Collins, and Tank Dell, along with second-year quarterback C.J. Stroud. He's going to have a ton of room to run, and they're going to constantly be in scoring position, which means plenty of yards per carry and plenty of touchdown opportunity for Joe Mixon. Do I really need to tell you anything else? Keep an eye on his ADP, because if he's not going in the top two or three rounds, he's going to be a steal. All right, Jacob, what you got? Let's hear your cons. Kevin, I see what you're saying, but let's be real. Joe Mixon is past his prime, and the Texans, while they made a lot of good moves this offseason, this was not one of them. Mixon has been inefficient as a runner for the last four years. Over that time period, the best he's done is 4.1 yards per carry in a season, and twice he's had under four yards per carry, so he's not getting great efficiency. And in this Texans offense, he might even get less volume as well, and I think that is a cause for concern. An inefficient running back with less volume, that does not equal fantasy success, and I would not touch Joe Mixon this season. This is a poker hand I played at Shuffle 512 in Austin, Texas. In this hand, the under the gun and the under gun plus one limped, and then the MP raised to $15. I called in the big blind with 8-7 suited, and then the under the gun limp re-raised to 50. The under the gun plus one folded, the MP called, and I decided to call as well since I'm closing the action and getting a good price. The flop came 9-8-2 rainbow with one spade, so I flopped a pair and a backdoor flush draw and straight draw. The under the gun bet $35, the MP called, and since I'm getting such a great price, I think I have to continue here to see if I can turn more equity. So I call and the turn comes the five of spades. Obviously this is a great card for us as we pick up a gutter and a flush draw to go along with our middle pair. I check again and now the under the gun goes all in for 65. The MP folds and I think now we have a clear call. My pair obviously is gonna be behind most of the time but we're getting a very good price here, getting over four to one. We have the direct odds to call. So I make the call and we make our flush and scoop this pot as our opponent mucks pocket nines face up. This is another hand I played at Shovel 512 in Austin, Texas. In this hand, the straddle was on, so we were playing 125. Two players limp to me in the middle position, and I make it $20 with Ace Queen offsuit, which is probably too small. I should probably be going 25 or 30 here. But anyway, I made it 20, and one player calls me, and now the small blind jams for about 160. This player was pretty tilted at this point, so I thought he had like a small pair or some kind of hand that he's trying to flip with to see if he can either double up or go home. And then after that is when the hand got a little bit off the rails. Now the first limper jams all in for about 180. This is a really wild guy who could have any two cards here. So I don't put too much stock in that. And now the second limper also goes all in for less for 100. And I think at this point I have no choice but to call. I think I'm getting way too good of odds to fold here. And I think I just have to go with my hand. So I do go with my hand here, knowing that a lot of the times I will win, a lot of the times I will lose. And this time we do win. We hit an ace on the river and scoop versus the small blind player who had king jack, the first limper who had 6-3 offsuit, and then the second limper that also had king jack. So we take down a pretty nice pot here. And I kind of wanted to make a greater point about this situation. And that's whenever you are in a game with a bunch of splashy players that want to get in pots, they want to gamble, and you know you have a hand that's getting the right odds to call, um, but isn't the super nuts, you can't be scared. You have to put in the call. Embrace the fact that sometimes you are going to lose. Embrace the fact that there's going to be variance in this game. You have to ride the variance train and make the right play even when it's scary, even when you don't want to do it, and even when you're not going to win every time. 
And at the end of the day, if you do this consistently, if you make the right plays when you're getting the right odds against splashy players, you're going to print money in the long run. And so don't worry on the, on the short-term results so much. Focus on the long run and make the right plays when you can. How's it going, everyone? We're going to discuss a few hands from our trip to Shreveport. Point one three at the horseshoe, and I look down at king queen off suit. I raised to fourteen dollars, and three people call. Now the button, who had been super tight, raised to forty five. Alarm bells are going off. Convince myself it's a position raise, and I make the call, and so does the hijack. The flop comes. The queen of clubs, the ten of diamonds, the six of clubs. Now I lead for fifty one. Just to see if maybe he had pocket jacks or tens I could get him to fold. The hijack calls, and now the button jams all in. I'm paying that call, paying that I bet on the flop, and I do find the fold and the hijack snap calls. The turn is the eight of hearts, and the river is the six of diamonds. The hijack shows pocket jacks, and the button shows pocket kings to win and have us destroyed. So again, if your gut's telling you a player type is someone that's only playing just super monsters, find the fold. Don't even make the call. Um, I would have saved myself practically $100. So, you know, it's one of those mistakes I made, and I, I got mad at myself for doing it because I knew better. So those are things for you to learn and do better yourself. All right, for our second hand, we are still playing at the horseshoe. Playing one three still, I'm done. Bets twenty dollars. Four players call, and I look down at Ace King of Hearts in the small blind. I said before, I tend to play Ace King a lot, like Jack Ten, as I draw in hand. So I flat to get max value, especially if I make a monster. We got six ways to flop. The flop is the King of Diamonds, the King of Clubs, and the Ten of Clubs. Now, I lead for 38 to get some loose calls and to hide the fact that I flop trips. Since in low limit, most players check call when they flop trips and kind of gives it away if you're paying attention at all. Two players call. Now, the cutoff goes in for 145. I make the call and the rest fold. The turn is the Ace of Spades, so I make a boat and the river's four diamond. The cutoff shows... King Jack offsuit, and I show my boat and win. And, you know, people can hate the way that I played it. Even people at the table were like, wow, he had Ace King. You know, he didn't play that right. But uh, I've gone broke more times than I can count playing Ace King GTO on low limit because usually if you're getting into three or four bet, at those stakes, you're up against just a super nutted hand so i will three bet occasionally i definitely will open raise uh but i i just tend not to get into four bets or going all in pre-flop with it because i know that usually i'm only going to get called by you know jacks plus normal queens plus which queens against i'm flipping but i'd rather evaluate after a turn so that's kind of my way you can think comment below if you want to tell me how terrible i played ace king but you know what i got a monster at that one and i got extra value and i scooped the pot welcome to miller time i'm kevin miller with the degenerate gambling life and on today's episode i am going to discuss with y'all the top five players who have gained the most value in Dynasty over the past year. And with that, without further ado, here we go. At number five, none other than running back Rashad White on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Now, this time last year, he was coming in around RB 25 to 30 in Dynasty, and after putting together a top 10 season, he's now right on that fringe of the top 10 running backs in Dynasty and is in that top 30 or 40 overall range. I think he's gained a ton of value, and I think there's only one other running back that gained more value than Rashad White in Dynasty last year. At number four, wide receiver Tank Dell on the Houston Texans. He was starting to light the league up before he suffered a season-ending leg injury last year. And yes, they have Stephon Diggs, but he's old and will have a very short time, you know, maybe one or two seasons in Houston if he stays healthy and plays it, you know. But Tank Dell is the future of that team. I'm sorry if you just watch his highlights. He's open. He's fast. He's going to be very productive in today's NFL. And this time last year, he was, you know, he was a late second, early third pick in rookie drafts. But now he's a top 25 to 30 overall player. So if you have him on your team, 
consider yourself very lucky that you picked good last year. At number three, tight end Trey McBride on the Arizona Cardinals. He really started to come on strong with a insane amount of targets towards the end of last year. I mean, I'm talking more targets than Travis Kelsey in the prime of his career. Trey McBride is very young. He's I have him ranked over Sam Laporta as the tight end one in Dynasty. I don't care which one of those two you want to take, toss a coin, but Trey McBride Trey McBride, as of right now, has a lot less competition for targets, and I do think he is the Arizona Cardinals' number one target getter as of right now. Obviously, if they draft Marvin Harrison, that changes a little bit, but I don't think his dynasty value changes even 1%, no matter what. At number two, running back Kyron Williams. Now, as a Rams fan, it's great to see someone emerge out of nowhere, but... I did not see this one coming. He wasn't ranked in any top 400 overall. And if you go back to his rookie year two years ago, he was being taken as a fourth or fifth round pick in rookie drafts, which for those of you that have done rookie drafts in Dynasty, you know that anything after the second or third round is practically worthless. And maybe one or two players in the fourth or fifth round will pop total out of your entire draft. And... To have a top 10 year last year, even though he suffered an injury and overtook Cam Akers, I think was insane. I do genuinely believe that as long as McVay is coaching my beloved Rams, they will have an elite wide receiver and an elite running back for fantasy purposes. I don't know if it's Kyron or not. I think right now it is, but they could draft somebody or we'll see. I think that right now Kyron Slade is a top 25 overall player and he has he's probably the riskiest, uh, most volatile player in that top 25, but... His value went from borderline top 500 to top 25 overall value, and that's just insane. And finally, the player who gained the most value over the last year is none other than... Who? Who is it? That's right, you guessed it. It's another one of my beloved Rams. Puka Nakua came into the league and lit it up. This guy is the real deal, and I'm not worried about him regressing and becoming a nobody. Um, he's got all the charisma and talent in the world. And with Cooper Cup aging out of the team, he's basically going to take over that role of slot and possession receiver. And I'd be I'd be shocked if he didn't have another 125-plus target season with 100 catches or so this year. I think he's got a good next few years in the league. I think he's a borderline top 10 overall dynasty asset. Well, just to be safe, I'll call him a top 15 to 20 overall dynasty asset. And if you got him... Hold on to him, or if you're in my league, trade him to me, please. As a Rams fan, I'm begging you, I'll overpay. Those are the players who gained the most value. Make sure you guys like and subscribe to our channel. We really appreciate it. And leave a comment below and let me know if you think I forgot about anyone. Until next time, Miller out. Soccer hooligans. Welcome back to another edition of the Adam Minutes with me, your boy, Jordan Tennis. We're going to pay homage today to two clubs that we've actually been talking about quite a lot recently, but they've both achieved some big, big things within their club history. First up is Bayer Leverkusen, with who, for the first time in their 120-year history, they have won the Bundesliga. How did they win the Bundesliga? Well, they beat Werder Bremen 5-0 on the back of a Florian Wirtz hat trick. It was, uh, I believe, all three goals came in the second half that were just punctuation points on their emphatic win to win the league. Ihr werdet nie Deutschmeister is what was chanted from the stands, which means you will never be German champions, as their rival fans used to deride them with. So they were taking it back. They were throwing it back at all their rivals who thought that they would never do it. They have done it. Five runner-ups, six third places, but they have gotten over the top this year. They have their second leg of the Europa League quarterfinals this Thursday against West Ham, and they will play in the DFP, DFB Pokal Final May 25th against Kaiser Slautern. 
and if they can win out here they will go undefeated this season which would be an, an absolutely incredible accomplishment other team that we are looking at is Rexham because Rexham have secured promotion for the second straight season last season they were promoted to League Two and this year they guaranteed promotion to League One which is the third tier in the English football pyramid it goes Premier League Championship League One which is where they'll be next year and League Two which is the league that they're currently wrapping up they can still actually win the league they did not just win promotion they could still win the league they have to win out and they have Stockport County needs to lose at least two of their next games in order for Rexham to win that league. And hey, Rexham, Stockport, they play in the last game of the season. So that one could be on the line. We'll see about that. But how did they gain? How did they secure promotion? Well, MK Dons and Burrow dropped points while Rexham beat Forest Green 6-0. to zero. And I mean, it was just an insane win. When you're pumping in six goals against anyone, your team came, they saw, they conquered. So congratulations to Rexham. And once again, congratulations to Bayer Leverkusen. Two incredible accomplishments. They will be fun teams to follow next season. How's it going, everyone? Going to jump into a little bit of fancy baseball now and some players for you to pick up on the waiver wire. First up, Michael Bush, Chicago Cubs. He gives you first base and third base eligibility. Love when they give you position flexibility. He's available currently in 41% of leagues, but I expect that to keep getting less and less. He's currently player 16. The last two weeks, he's hit five home runs. He scored seven runs, he has 11 RBIs, and his batting average is a crazy 375. So this is a player that people will be running and scooping up. Just keep an eye on for whenever he starts to drop, and that hopefully doesn't go into too much of a downslide. Next player. It's a player I talked about for a sleeper before, so hopefully you picked him up. Maybe you hung on to him a little bit, but it is Sal for Lick on the Milwaukee Brewers. He's an outfielder. He was a first round draft pick. He's available in 77% of weeks, but some good things about him. The last two weeks has been player 74 overall. He's batting in the top half of that order, okay? So the top half of that order definitely has some spark to it. The bottom half is a little lackluster, but we do like players in that offense that are in the top six or so. In the last two weeks, he scored 10 runs, Five RBIs, three stolen bases, and he's giving you a 349 batting average. He's someone that I still think will give you pretty easy 2020, but at the rate he's stolen bases, he might even be like a 2040 guy, and so you would love that. So jump on him while he's available, and especially with the Brewers moving him higher and higher in the batting order. All right, that'll do it for this volume. I want to thank all of you guys that watched till the end. We very much appreciate it. We'll be in Vegas. June 6th to 10th. We haven't locked down when we'll do a meetup game. It is during the World Series of Poker, but we will have at least one and look forward to playing and seeing you guys there. Also, our website is live. Go check it out. We have different merch. We have hats. We have hoodies. We have dress shirts. We have polos. Everything you'd want for your DJL gear. Get it for yourself, someone special, or for Father's Day. Get, in, you know, get your father something special. If he likes to gamble. Um, it's also something you can wear on the golf course. All right, I'm digressing, but truly thank you for watching to end. If you haven't yet, please hit that like, comment, and subscribe button, and we'll see you guys next week.